welcome to the 20th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to interview Barney Brown from Intercontinental Music Lab. We've got another time-saving tip, and we'll read you your feedback. We'll, if That'll you're be entertaining <laughs> for you. <laughs> if you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I am Mark, and joining me this week are Alan. Hello. Tony. Good evening. And Laura. Hiya! <laughs> oh, it's so, it's so it annoying when, there <laughs> when somebody does that. Alan, what have you been up to? Playing Sudoku. Ooh, that sounds <laughs> That's fun. That's very... Have you been playing with on Ubuntu Touch? Yes. Ah, ah. there's the hook. <laughs> yes, I... So, um... Uh, some guys <laughs> developed a Sudoku app and we packaged it up and put it on the phone. And, um... I had a an hour train journey on Friday, so I thought, I know, I'll play Sudoku and find any bugs. And I found four bugs. So oh, was, it, was it that the numbers sure? didn't add up? <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, they were all valid, sensible bugs, and the guys have started working on them already. And, uh, yeah, they'll be fixed within the next day or so. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Cool. Apparently the uh, carrier advisory group have had a statement saying they're thrilled by good. the Sudoku app. Good. That's good to um, know. I know it, uh, in Indonesia, Sudoku is very popular. So uh, that's good news. <laughs> Tony, what have you been doing? Um, I had a couple of very popular blog posts in the last couple of weeks. Is that because <laughs> you used link bait titles? <laughs> yeah, massive trolling blog posts. No, it's, uh, it's accurate. I, I was... Uh, I happened to meet somebody who claimed to be the next Doctor Who in 1991. <laughs> and, um, very, very fashionable haircut you had back then, I noticed. Yeah, that, it was only about awesome, 11. Awesome yeah. shell suit. It wasn't a shell suit. It was, it was a... a a trousers and a separate coat. It's a fashionable shell suit. <laughs> okay. It wasn't actually a shell suit. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wrote about this because he's been interviewed on a late on one of the new Doctor Who DVDs the BBC have put out. Um, so I thought I'd write a bit about that. And just because I put the title of when I met the new Doctor Who, um, quite a lot of people visited that blog post. A bit like when we called an episode 10 Things I Hate About Spunto. Yeah. A lot, lot of people yeah. down there. Really? That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got so many more hits on that one than any other. Oh, yeah. I should think that through. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Laura? Uh, I was installing Windows XP. Oh, dear. On what? On VirtualBox. Oh, that's better. Okay. Hmm. And I got it installed with a little pointer from Sony for being stupid. Um, but then I, I can't install the security patches. <laughs> Because oh. you go to Windows Update and it says you can't install Windows Update because you haven't got Service Pack 3. And you can get Service Pack 3 from here. So I clicked the link and went there. It said, shall I forward you back to Windows Update where you can get Service Pack 3? I was like, no, haha, no, you can't. <laughs> download it manually. Click it to download it manually. It says, you can't install Service Pack 3 because you don't have Service Pack 2. <laughs> At that oh. point, I gave up and went to bed. So I'm half thinking I might just give up and get a new laptop that's got Windows 7 licensed with it. Why do you need Windows? Uh, for some software for uni. Uh. Um, so if anybody's got any recommendations for... Install Service Pack 2. Laptops. As per, the, as per the recommendation. That's what Microsoft say. For yeah. laptops that are quite lightweight with a screen, something like my Nexus 10. That would be very welcome. You could get a Windows Surface tablet. I don't want Windows 8. I want Windows 7. Uh. There's the kicker. It's funny. A few years ago, I uh, installed every single version of Windows there was at the time in <laughs> in QEMU, and that was good fun trying to install service packs on a Windows version that had Internet Explorer three or yeah. something, where you can't even visit websites these days. It just doesn't load. <laughs> there's, there's a really interesting blog someone did about he installed uh, Windows one on in a virtual machine and then upgraded it all the way up to <gasps> Windows seven. Wow. wow. And went through all the like the differences in the UI and where it kept like there was some where it kept settings which he'd set in Windows One was still set in Windows Seven. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. What about you, Mark? Uh my dad got married, so oh, I went to his congratulations. wedding and oh, awesome. drank lots of free wine. Were you a page boy? I wasn't. Oh. I was my brother was best man You're and, and did a very good speech. <laughs> and I um sort of stood around and looked handsome. Oh. <laughs> well somebody else too. Yeah. <laughs> Why awesome. change the habit of a lifetime? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Your sunburn had gone by then, presumably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sounds like a fun packed show. <laughs> On the line, we've got Barney Brown from the band Intercontinental Music Lab. Hello, Barney. 
Hello. And how are you this evening? I'm very well. Excellent. Yes. Thank you for I joining us. No problem at all. Um, so just to get us started, do you want to tell us what's special about Intercontinental Music Lab? We don't normally interview many bands on the show, so people will probably guess there's something a bit unusual about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So they, they, unfortunately, they couldn't be with me tonight uh, to share the interview mm-hmm. because because um, there's fifty of them, wow. and and they're based in Australia and America and Japan and Mallorca and Canada, cool. and probably probably some countries I don't even know about because to be frank, I haven't met I've only met about ten of them. <laughs> okay, um, and so. Perhaps I need to rewind a bit. And yeah, talk about so yeah, how did it all get started? <laughs> how did it get started? So I grew up in Cambridge and was in all sorts of different bands with lots of different friends. And um, over the years, you know, we established really good friendships through playing music together and recording music and performing live and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, but then a lot of them, bless them, left the UK and, and moved overseas to America and Australia and places like that. But we still wanted to be active as sort of musicians together. Mm-hmm. So we dreamed up a project in 2008 whereby we could collaborate and record online. Right. So we, we kind of, it, it was quite a, quite a long email train. I was trying to dig it out, actually, because it did sort of just flow out of a, an email train that started with something like, oh, I'm a bit bored. Let's, let's do something creative. <laughs> And so, we, uh, yeah. So do you just all like jump on Skype with your instruments, or what? How, how does it work? So we haven't we haven't tried that yet, actually. So we knew that many of us have kind of got kids, and when we used to to jam together in in rehearsal studios and stuff like that, we had no responsibilities at all. <laughs> so we could just go whenever we wanted. We wanted to create a concept whereby anyone could could dip in and, and contribute whenever it suited them. So we have a theme. Right. We came up with a theme for the first album, which was science. Okay. And then at that time, there were only 10 of us, so it was quite a small group. <laughs> and were you all scientists? Is that why you chose the theme? Well, we're just all geeks, really. Right. I mean, okay. s- s- some of us are professional musicians. Um, some of us have always just been kind of amateur or like signed to labels, but not necessarily made any money. <laughs> right. Um, so, but we will all. We wanted to choose a, a topic that we knew all of the people that are involved with would be interested in, mm-hmm. uh, and then around that theme, each each of the the guys picked a particular scientist or or area of science, mm-hmm. and then wrote some instrumental music around that particular topic. Right. So this is people like writing it on their own in their country or wherever they are. Yeah. Than, exactly. Right. Okay. Exactly. So, I mean, just having a quick look at the. The first album. So we had one of the one of the guys who's an amazing um, professional jazz musician mm-hmm. wrote, wrote a lovely piece of music, which is like German umpa, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> about sounds Will, a bit like our theme song. Yeah, well, um, about Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, who I guess discovered X rays. Mm-hmm. So that's he wrote the backing music, right? And then what? Well, oh, no, I'm getting sent that getting around so everyone else. Confused. <laughs> this is why it's so confusing. The backing music was written by someone in America, okay? And then and then he handed it over to the professional jazz musician, right? Who then who then wrote and sung about sung about um, the discovery of X rays okay. over the top of this track. So these two were these two bits done completely in, independently of one another, then? Yeah. So for that album, I kind of o- organised the the sort of distribution of all the tracks. Right. So we gave everybody a month to come up with backing tracks mm-hmm. and to specify what they wanted someone else to write about. Right. Okay. So then I had ten pieces of music to listen to, and then a list of top topics, and then I had to think about the people that that were involved and think, right, who would sound interesting singing over that particular track? Um, and basically matched everybody up. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, deliberately challenging. So say you've got someone who, who's sort of natural um, background might be sort of drum and bass. You might get them to do some German umpa or whatever. Right. Just because just, it's Mix a nice it little... A bit. <laughs> I think it's really important to have restrictions in creative projects. <laughs> and um, so, give, give, you know, what then happened was you basically, you, you had an email 
So I had an email that arrived. Um, well, I mean, I, I chose the piece of music for me, actually, so it was a bit easy for me the first album. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a sort of Sergio Mendes track, um, Brazilian music, okay. really upbeat. And I was told that I had to write a piece of music about Alberto Santos Dumont, who built flying machines, basically. Right. And he used to um, he used to fly around Paris in a, a sort of, I think it was probably helium in those days, a helium balloon with, with propellers that he used to use pedaling, you know, like a cycle bicycle on, on the device, cycle it around Paris. <laughs> and he used, he used to tether it to lampposts. <laughs> I, and I never would have known any of this had I not had to write a song about this guy. Um, throw a rope ladder out of the flying machine, you know, go into a bar, pro- probably have a few night, a few dances, a few nice ladies, hmm. and then cl- climb up the rope ladder and, and, and fly off. So, you know. Yeah. So once, was, you, once you'd made this first album, you got 10 yeah. songs. Did you approach a record company? How did you, what did you do? How did you release it? <laughs> so originally we, we put it together as a little nice, li- nice little present to give to each other. Right. Christmas, okay. Basically. And we listened to it and we thought it was sort of quite listenable, really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, listenable or unlistenable? Uh, listenable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Listenable. Um, it, it was, it was a joke really. <laughs> and and actually everybody put their heart and soul into it <laughs> which caught us all a bit off guard so we quickly set up a uh, a website yeah oh it's called the intercontinental music lab by the yeah. way which was t- picked from a list of about 200 names which is <laughs> which is what happens when you ask 10 musicians what should we call the band right. yeah <laughs> yes and it all comes back um so we stuck it on a website right okay and, we didn't. We didn't sort of. We didn't know anything about Creative Commons licensing or anything like that. We just sort of said, you know, help yourself. Yeah. Um, and pretty soon, people started downloading it. And I, I guess because we we put all the lyrics up on the site, mm-hmm. and the topics were, were about such kind of niche things. Anybody that was looking for a history of, of a sort of um, a scientist, por- yeah, Portuguese inventor <laughs> of flight machines, <laughs> right? There's, you know, they'd come across a song about it and think, "Oh, right, I wasn't expecting that." Mm. And um, so we ended up getting on podcasts and things, yeah. And then somebody got in contact saying, "You should really put this out on Gemendo, which right. I hadn't heard of before, and it's a wonderful site for distributing Creative Commons music." Mm-hmm. And and I hadn't heard of Creative Commons at that point either. So I read up about the licensing, and it sounded very sensible in other words a sort of you know easy well, i guess your listeners don't all know about it um well and easy so. yeah okay <laughs> but yeah so it means that yeah people can they're free to to share there's no sort of barrier that says you're you're not allowed to give this to someone else basically doesn't it yeah exactly it means that you can if you're an ethical mass downloader you can look at something and know that you're allowed to download it and the, in fact the artists are encouraging you to do so yeah so so we, we we thought that was great and in line with what we wanted to do which we were making up as we went along quite frankly yeah we, we stuck it on that site and then more people started downloading it um a kid in washington state downloaded it from Jamendo, and then he said can i put it out as a torrent on um, mini nova and i didn't really know what torrent files were because obviously i'd never downloaded any illegal software in my life and so, <laughs> so, so yeah so i read up about that and again i thought oh yeah why not see mm-hmm. what happens he was he was lovely and it, he packaged it all up and put it out on mini nova which at, at the time i think i think this is probably 2009 probably something like that mm-hmm. so at that point I think it was it, already creative commons yet, yeah it was, yet he actually exactly. asked you for permission before doing it yeah that's nice which it's really no really nice exactly um and at that time i think mini nova was like among one of the top 10 search terms on mm. google or something like that <laughs> right. um and we started to get hundreds of downloads which we were really pleased about because mm. we thought we were going to get 10 yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe like our parents would download it um but then then mini nova got I think at, the, at that stage, um, there was masses of illegal music on mm-hmm. on Mini Nova, and it basically got 
I don't know which court it was, but it basically got shut down and they were told that they could only host content that was being distributed legally. So things which had licenses like Creative Commons licenses on it. Right. Uh, which meant for a beautiful moment, um, there were about three bands on one of the most popular <laughs> websites in the world, including ours. And and so the downloads went through the roof. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and and we pretty soon had 200,000 albums downloaded, wow. um, wow. which given that we just did it as a little joke mm. amongst ourselves, we, we started to think, oh, <laughs> we might have to start being... Um, if we do another one of these albums, we're going to have to try even harder to make it really high quality because people are actually listening to it. Yeah. So, and, and, are you going to do another one of those albums? Well, so, so we've now done. Let's have a look again. I have to look at the site because it's it got a bit crazy after that one, two, three, four. We've done eight eight albums now. Oh, wow. <laughs> we we did eight albums in. I think it, we, we tried to do one every three months and then we started to burn out a little bit. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, <laughs> The difficult so ne- fourth album in a year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. So um, typically the, al- the albums, you know, the albums got longer and more ambitious as the project progressed. Mm-hmm. Um, fans got in contact and said, can we join the band? And we're like, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, and that's how we got to 50 people in the band. Wow. Um, and and you, we've now do you, had... Do you accept donations or do you charge for any of the the media or anything i mean and is money a thing you even think about well this is this is what's amusing me when just just remembering it all now whilst i'm talking to you guys um it never crossed our mind (laughs) to make any money out of it um it was really funny is when we had all of those downloads the first thing we thought was um how we were going to have to up our game for the next album (laughs) because people were actually listening to it Right. Um, I think we figured it, that it, any kind of charging model that we had, we had absolutely no idea how we divvy up all the money, you know, because you've, you've got... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and now you've got 50 people in the band, you know, and, and, and those maybe There may be someone that pops in the living room one night and plays a triangle and then, and then pops out again. And yeah. Like, how many... How much credit do you give them? And we thought it would... We thought if we were selling it, it would make people potentially self-censor what they were doing. And we really wanted people to be as crazy as possible and not, not feel any restraints. Um, we, I think at one point we were going to put a donate button on the website. Um, but um, despite the fact that I build websites in my, in my day job, um, I, never, <laughs> I never got around to doing it. I, I guess <laughs> but we... We had a random email, a lovely, lovely email from this woman in um, Alaska just saying, you know, I, I've always loved your music. I find it really entertaining and inspiring. and I really want to give you some money. Um, and I sort of emailed her back sort of saying, are you sure? That's really nice of you. Are you sure? I mean, we, it'd be nice <laughs> to get a bit of money to help us um, with the web hosting costs. Wow. And then she just she gave us seventy five quid, which we thought was amazing. Wow! Um, so we've 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 gone double platinum, and, <laughs> and we've made seventy five quid. That's more than Simon Cowell's acts make out yeah, there. Exactly. <laughs> Their yeah, first eight could... albums. <laughs> so, um, where would people go if they want to find out more about your music, or download your music, or maybe even donate you another seventy five quid? Oh. Uh... Well, that would, that would keep us running for another three years. <laughs> um, you, you can either Google Intercontinental Music Lab. Right. Or, or we are on Twitter on iMusic Lab. Mm-hmm. And um, we've, we've put pretty much all of our tracks up on YouTube now just because it's quite a nice player cool. to embed onto the site. Yeah. Um, you can download it all from Gemendo. All of the albums are up there. Yeah. Um, and then they are out on there on torrents. The torrent sites are quite nice because you you can get sort of flax and Apple lossless and all that sort of cool. thing. Because we're oh, nice. we're all we're all geeks and we like to get it out there in in lossless formats wherever possible. Yeah, uh, we'll um, make sure we put some links in the show notes as well. Cool, brilliant. Yeah, and um, also Bandcamp. All right, uh, yeah, we really like and a lot of these things. What's been nice is is sort of discovering what other bands not. Not like us, but <laughs> being in other, other indie bands are doing out there. And, and Bandcamp seems to be a fantastically supportive community that, I don't know, it, it has a flavour to me. It seems a bit 
a bit like the way that photographers support each other on Flickr. Mm -hmm. There's a very sort of positive energy there, and it, it hasn't got any of the sort of Bebo-like um, <laughs> trimmings of MySpace. It just sort of, yeah, it's, mm. it's very nicely done. And I, I've, I've bought a lot of music. That's the, where I buy most of my music now is actually Bandcamp. You get some incredible albums for sort of five quid and really, really great, genuine music cool. without any wow. inhibitions. Well, uh, thanks very much for coming on and talking to us, Barney. And uh, no best of luck with your next album. Cheers. All right. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Time for Command Line Love. Mm. Oh, yes it is. And what are we loving this week? Well, are you ever on the command line and you want to open mm. a file with an appropriate GUI application, but you can't remember the name of the app? All the time. <laughs> well, this is for you. Excellent. Uh, you just, say you're in a terminal, you just type xdg-open and then the file name. Wow. That's really cool. So if I was, if I had a text file I wanted to edit, and I couldn't remember the name of G Vin, Vin or, <laughs> or an editor. I could type xdg open and then the name of the text file, myfile.txt, and it would open G edit yeah. if that was my well, default. It would editor. open whatever your default editor is. Because yes. this, is, this is a really annoying problem, especially with GNOME applications, because GNOME applications are always called in the menu something like PDF viewer, but they're actually called something like events, events or mm. something. And you never see that name anywhere at all. So you've got no idea that when you're on the command line, you want to type that, or um, like opening something in Open Office. Oh yeah, it's uh, a real writer. Pain. Or, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's, no, it's L O writer. Well, well who, who knows? knows? You don't I need don't... to worry about it anymore, Alan, because there's this. Yes, this app. This was uh, this was sent in by Alex Wainwright, who's listening in from Brisbane, Australia. Good day, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I you were Have a your... Fosters on us. <laughs> I thought you were going to do your world-renowned Australia uh, accent. No. No, that, uh, anyway. It's truth. Or is that me? I don't it know. is you, isn't it? Your South African accent. Mine's, mine's great South African accent. Ooh, you Ooh. did that without practice. <laughs> I did. It took all my brain power. <laughs> There's none left for the rest of the show. But yes, thank you, Alex. XDG yes. Open is brilliant. Very useful. Thank you. <laughs> it's time for the feedback uh costalis emailed us to say hi it would be great to hear our favorite podcast talking about gufw cheers i so, suggest you uh, go and download your favorite podcast then. yeah we forwarded this to <laughs> the <laughs> <Linux> outlaws <laughs> <laughs> forwarded it oh he means us he does i read it as guffwa guffwa it's a firewall no, it's not. Uh, Is it not? No, nope. it's oh. a graphical user interface Four front them. end to the firewall. Because uh, the firewall's already there. It's, uh, it's firewall, it's firewall um, U, F, well, uncomplicated firewall. Yes. Yes. Oh, and this is an interface for it. Oh, okay. So this is an interface for... I know! Amazing, isn't it? Yes. It's an interface for an interface for a firewall. Yes. Because it still all relies on IP tables in the Linux kernel. Exactly. Cool. And uh, yeah, I think there's an ulterior motive why he might say this. I think he's actually the maintainer of that. <laughs> the principal developer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sole founder, funder, <laughs> and chairman of the. So we'll have a link in the show notes. And, uh, yeah, maybe we will talk to him, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. If he hears later, this. find out. Lawrence Whiteside emailed in to say... Last week's podcast included an email from someone who wanted recent examples of someone getting reimbursed for an unused Windows OEM pre-install license. I don't know if 12 months counts as recent, but I was able to get Asus to reimburse me for an unused Windows 7 license on one of their netbooks. I had to phone them and get them to email me a form, complete and return it, wait for them to email me yet another form, and return it by snail mail along with the original license, which I had to remove intact from the machine. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> this was about as easy as removing the bandages from an Egyptian mummy without damaging them, but it can be done with great care. My reimbursement arrived about three months later, all 20 euros of it. <laughs> brackets, I live in France, close brackets. But it was the principle, damn it. Yeah, and it gets even harder now with UEFI because you have to boot and 
I think you have to accept the license mm, now yeah. to get into UFI tools. I think this is yeah. where the conversation started. Yes, that's right. When we started to talk about that. Yes. So, um, yeah, well done. Yeah, um, well, glad somebody got, got oh, they're 20 euros. Sounds like a lot of hassle for something that's basically not worth it. Well, yeah, but as he says, it is the principle, damn it. It is. <laughs> um, but that's Windows 7. So Windows 8 is a whole different kettle of fish, as we say. Yes, it is. Um, and we received this Skype voicemail from Robbie P. Reshaw. Hi guys, um, I'm loving the podcast. I'm really intrigued to hear some people's walkarounds on the um, Windows 8 secure BIOS problem in one of your shows due to the fact that I am due a upgrade to a laptop and is it worth buying a Dell with it being too preloaded? Just want to say I love the show. You're really doing a very good job and hats off to you guys for pulling it off thank you robbie well that was lovely well mm. the answer is of course yes it's always uh, a good idea to buy a dell uh, machine with Ubuntu <laughs> installed always always tell them alan pope sent you <laughs> no no don't do that. <laughs> don't do that don't do that don't don't phone them up don't. um uh yeah so uh, it's tricky isn't it because uh as is always the case when you buy a new machine, uh, it comes with uh, Windows 8 n- more often than not. We yes. did actually um, get an email, I think, with someone who sent us a link to um, a site that does, um, you know, you can buy a laptop from them, customise it and say, no Windows, please. Oh, what, and they buy it? Yes, they buy it. They remove Windows <laughs> and they put your Linux version and send it well, on to you. No, you, 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 say, you say select Windows version. So say its default is Windows 7. You can say, I want Windows 7 Professional, Windows 7 Home, Windows 8, whatever. No, please take £20 off. Right. So some of the smaller vendors will do that. Yeah. Um, but, but most yeah, of the big ones won't. Most of the big ones won't. Um, but yes. Uh, yeah. So the other, the other option is, you know, vote with your wallet and uh, buy from one of the vendors uh, who... Um, uh, who do sell with Linux or a clean machine. Yep. Like System76 in the US or not many other options elsewhere. If you know other options where to get laptops and desktops with. <laughs> go to China. Yes. Or, yeah, go to one of the very many shops in India and China. Um, it's me. <laughs> it yes, is. yes, it is. Um, Kevin O'Brien emailed about the Ohio Linux Fest. We're rapidly approaching the deadline where we need to close the call for talks and start planning the 2013 program. Uh, it closes officially on Monday. Sev- uh, oh, cool. <laughs> American Day format. Either water. 7th of the 8th or 8th of the 7th. The I'm the guessing 8th of the 7th, uh, which is getting very close. If you could make mention of this in your programs, hmm. If you're listening live, bear in mind that the call for talks will end. Monday. If you're listening on the recorded version as this goes out, it's already closed. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry about, about that. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you should have listened to the live stream. Yeah, you missed your opportunity to get your talks in for Ohio Linux Fest, run by Kevin O'Brien, not Kevin O'Brain, oh, as yeah. uh, Mark Oh, said. sorry, I, I couldn't, I, yeah, obviously can't read very well. I, 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 spelt, I spent a minute trying to work out which one it was, but yeah, I can see now it's O'Brien. And 50-50. <laughs> which one it was? How many O'Brains do you know? Dara O'Brain. Breen. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Weir <laughs> Dan Weir an email from somewhere in Northern Europe maybe Norway or Germany thanks for this week's show I was really impressed with the what Code Club are doing personally I think that teaching kids the basics of how a computer works is absolutely vital since it will let them know what a computer can and maybe equally important what a computer can't do or at least not easily I think that's more important than letting them build spreadsheets they can easily learn that after we squeeze all the fun out of computers for them. Keep up the good work. <laughs> nice one. Oh, thank, thank you, you Dan. Also, the drama from Iron Maiden is called Nico McBrain. <laughs> He's not a real person. <laughs> He's a fictional character. Yes. <laughs> or something. Anyway. And that's all your feedback. Thank you. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that entertains, engages, or enrages you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch 
I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And that's all for this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Join us on Wednesday the 17th of July at 19.30 UTC for our next live episode. That's half past eight in the evening for those in the UK. Yes, indeed. Um, busy week coming up for anybody? No. No. <laughs> yes. Not. What are you doing, Laura? Working. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I you know, think it's these conversations that make this show worthwhile. I think we should get Coffee Walnut Cake again from the co-op. It clearly gives no, us a bit of a buzz. Mark keeps leaving all his walnuts on my plate. Right. Uh, I'm not going to make any comment. Join us next time. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.